In my last video, I showed you my self-designed magnetron. A magnetron utilizes a strong magnetic field to focus a plasma above the so-called target. The charged particles of this plasma are accelerated towards the target and knock atoms out of the surface. This way objects can be coated with various materials such as metals or ceramics. If you want to know more about that, I recommend watching my last video. As already announced in that video, today I will talk in more detail about the individual components and explain the design decisions to you. At the end of the video, I will list the cost of the different components for you. To help you follow along better, I will occasionally display the CAD model of the magnetron. All the CAD files will be available for my tier 2 patrons or higher. Okay, I have the magnetron mounted in my vise and I would say we just take it apart and talk about all of the different parts and what my thoughts were when designing them. By the way, I think I will never get tired of the nice interference colors of the titanium oxide layers. Okay, here you can see the top part of what I would call the ground shield, the tube around the magnetron. And at this part you can see the first major design consideration, which are these holes right here. They are one millimeter in diameter and all of the threads in this magnetron have these holes if they are in a vacuum. And they are meant as vent holes so we don't have any virtual leaks. If you have an enclosed space in a vacuum system which is not sealed by for example an o-ring, that means that the air which is trapped in this hole will diffuse out of the threads slowly and basically contaminate your vacuum. By creating a separate pathway through which the air can escape, you basically alleviate that issue. This outer tube of the ground shield is only clamped down with three screws. The reason is that it would interfere with the other screws at the bottom here if I would have added more. The ground shield is basically an off-the-shelf stainless steel tube because it would have been very expensive to get a part like this machined, which means that the tolerances of course aren't that tight and you basically all of the times have a welding seam on the inside because these tubes get folded and then welded. That's also the reason why the top part has a little bit of play. I didn't want to design the fit too close and I don't see any problems with this being a little bit loose. You just have to be careful when tightening it down that you don't pull it to one side. But I mean it's maybe half a millimeter of play. I created these cutouts here by using a 3D printed template which I slid over the top and then I used an end mill in my drill to basically mill those slots here out. That's why they are not very pretty as you can see. The holes at the top were also made with a template. From the side view right here you can on the one hand clearly see all of the different vent holes here and also the layer design of this magnetron. My design choice was that I don't want any radial seals like piston seals because I wasn't sure that I'm experienced enough to get the tolerances right. The way it is designed right now we basically only have o-ring seals at the faces of these layers which can be compressed together. This part right here is what I would call the target clamp. It is just there to hold down your material, your sputtering, in this case a piece of of titanium to the copper part of the magnetron. It can easily be used for thicker targets and it would just sit a little bit proud of the copper surface. The slots in the ground shield are of course meant to accommodate those thicker targets by also raising it. Below this copper cooling plate is the water cooling channel and of course the magnets. You can see my screwdriver sticking to it. And I have also made these cutouts here in the side so I would be able to get a screwdriver, a flathead screwdriver in there and leverage out a target which would stick to the magnets. If I for example sputter iron it would of course be attracted by the magnets and I could just use a screwdriver to get it out of there. This magnetron is designed for two inch targets but it can be used for targets which are a little bit larger. I just increased the diameter of this recess here a little bit so I could use targets which aren't exactly two inches in diameter. To be able to disassemble this magnetron further I will have to turn it around so give me a second. Here you can see the bottom of the magnetron with the stainless steel tube with a KF16 flange attached to it and that's basically the major design difference between for example the magnetron of Applied Science or Thought Emporium. By the way both are great channels and you probably know them, if not you should definitely check them out. But both of their designs had the cooling water tubes and also the high voltage cable exposed to the vacuum which has two consequences. 
On the one hand, you need two feed-throughs for your water cooling and you need another feed-through for your high voltage. And it also means that the plastic from the water cooling tubes and your high voltage cable is exposed to the vacuum. So if you're using, for example, a plasma cleaning setup, you will over time erode your plastic hoses and contaminate your vacuum. And of course, water will slowly saturate the plastic from the hoses and diffuse in your vacuum. I don't think it's a huge problem considering that you're sputtering at relatively high pressures, but yeah, I think it's a nice benefit. In the case of this magnetron, your main feed-through is this stainless steel tube here. It just seals against one fitting here, which is clamped to the vacuum chamber, which means you have neither the water cooling tubes nor your high voltage cable exposed to the vacuum. The inside of this magnetron is basically at atmospheric pressure. You just saw me remove some kept on tape and if you've watched my other video, you know that I added it because I was suspecting that arcing is happening between the screws down here and this bottom part which is at ground potential. The complete upper part here is at a high voltage potential which means that the screws which are connecting it to this bottom part are also at a high voltage potential. For that reason I created these PTFE insulators here which insulate them to this bottom part. The problem is that the distance between these screws and the bottom part is not very far and as you can see by the charring of the Teflon right here at this screw here and also right here so a good upgrade for a future version would be some kind of insulation at the bottom of these screws here. Maybe a secondary shield which just goes at the bottom right here. The KF16 flange just clamps to the bottom of the magnetron by using these half circles here and six M8 screws. One thing I would also change in the next design is to make this part a little bit thinner. The reason is that there's not a lot of room to clamp this o-ring down. It is sufficient to get it vacuum tight and to stop it from spinning or in any kind of way wobble around. But yeah, I would just feel more confident if there was a little bit more space to clamp it down. And the high voltage cable and also the cooling water cable is then just uh, fed through the stainless steel tube. Interestingly, you can see that there is some cooling water on those hoses. That's something a commenter on my last video warned me about, that those festool fittings on the inside, you will see later, are not very good in holding any pressure. And it takes some pressure to pump the water through the tiny water cooling channel inside the copper block. So maybe it's leaking through there. It wasn't nearly enough to drip out of the stainless steel tube, but I mean, it's more than it should be because it should be nothing. So let's remove the screws holding down the bottom part. I'm wondering, you know how I could find that out? <laughs> I will just taste the water here because I'm cooling the magnetron with a cooling unit which has a temperature below room temperature and I'm wondering if that is actually just um, condensation. And since I'm using an antifreeze mixture in my cooler, I should be able to taste it, but it just tastes slightly off. <laughs> so I don't actually think it's leaking. I think that's condensation. To make it easier for us to work on this magnetron, I will now remove the cooling water tubes and also the high voltage cable. The high voltage cable was just bent into a hook and then screwed down to the copper plate. The base plate right here has an O-ring which seals to this PTFE insulator ring here and it is screwed to the top part of the magnetron through these holes here, through the PTFE insulator into the top part. I have dimensioned all of the o-ring grooves to fit o-rings which are commonly available so I wouldn't have to buy any obscure size which is hard to get. The PTFE insulator ring has these additional holes here to fit the screws which hold the copper top part to this middle part right here. And on the other side of the PTFE insulator ring there's again an o-ring sealing it to the top part. Those o-rings are of course necessary because as I've said before 
the inside of the magnetron is at atmospheric pressure, which means we have to seal it to the vacuum. Here you can see the top part, which is at a high voltage potential. Again, all of the holes in this magnetron have venting holes, even those through holes you can see right here. The only holes that don't have these venting holes are the ones which clamp down the KF16 flange. The reason is that there was no access to them. If you look from the side, here there is this hole in the way and on this axis here there is the hole which clamps down the ground shield. And I also thought it would be very challenging to get a one millimeter hole from the outside all the way to the inside right here. It could definitely be done but I thought that the parts would maybe get more expensive. I haven't had any problems with these holes here not having venting holes but one solution of course would be to just slot the threads of these screws or drill a hole through the middle of them. And you can see the threads of the screws that hold these two parts together at the top here. I just left these holes open because this gives the air an extra path to escape. And again on the underside of this part there is an o-ring which seals against the face of the copper plate on the top here. You can already see a huge problem with my magnetic yoke here. This is just an iron plate which sits at the back of the magnets to provide a path for the magnetic field lines. And since it is not stainless steel, it is corroding. So I'm thinking about nickel plating it or something similar to get some corrosion resistance. The magnetic yoke is held onto the copper back plate with a separate screw so it won't rattle around inside the magnetron. Here you can see the magnet assembly. I'm just wondering how bad of an idea it is to lift that out. Because this is the north pole, those are all south poles. Let me just get that back in there. <laughs> and let me get something. I actually 3D printed the whole magnetron before ordering the parts to be sure that everything fits. So I will try and use this part right here to hold the magnets in place. Ah, perfect, it fits. Yeah, this way they won't jump around and suddenly explode in my face. But as you can see, corrosion is a huge problem and I definitely have to do something about that. You can see it at the copper plate right here, all the iron oxide. So that's definitely something I have to improve. Or maybe use a alloy which is corrosion resistant but still magnetic. By the fact that there are a lot more magnets on the outside than on the inside, you can see that it is an unbalanced magnetron, which basically just means that the plasma is not confined directly above the target. It can reach out a lot further and you can use that fact to bombard your substrate with ions. Here is basically the last important part, which is the water cooling channel. An important design consideration you can see right here is that the water cooling channel is completely separated from the magnets. That's crucial because these magnets here will, even though they are coated, easily erode when in contact with water and the copper. I also wasn't aware of that fact when I designed my first version of this magnetron, but the member of the AGS in Braunschweig made me aware that you basically have to scrape your magnets out of your magnetron if they are in contact with the cooling water. Another important fact is that the cooling channel is sealed with the inner o-ring against the inner magnet and with this outer o-ring against the outer magnet. There is a third o-ring, which is the o-ring that sits around this part right here, which seals against this copper surface, which means that we have two o-rings between the water channel and our vacuum. That is important because o-rings will over time saturate with water and the water will then diffuse out of the o-ring in your vacuum chamber, which means you always want two o-rings between the water channel and your vacuum. Another fact that is not ideal is that there are a lot of threads in this copper part. There weren't a lot of options to avoid threads in the copper parts. Basically the only option available would be some thread inserts, for example made from stainless steel, or redesigning the complete magnetron. I intentionally designed this magnetron with 12 holes around the perimeter, so it can be easily divided, so I could easily use for example only 6 screws in case I damage one of the threads. But up until this point I haven't had any problems with the threads inside the copper. As you may have noticed, the magnetron is pretty big for a magnetron using 2 inch targets. There are two reasons for that. The first one is that I wanted to have the design where all of the seals are basically on the faces of the parts and not on the outside to make the tolerances of the part not that important. You can see that there is a little bit of play between all of these parts which makes machining easier. Which of course means that the screws clamping all of these parts together 
have to be somewhere. As you can see, the outside edge here is pretty thick because there are the screw holes for the target clamp and also the screw holes clamping this part to the copper part. And since this was my first project where I had to design different parts made from different materials, I wasn't very confident that I knew what the minimal material thickness needs to be. If you for example look at the o-ring grooves, you can see that there is this copper lip on the inside and also a location between the holes for the magnets and the outer o-ring groove where the copper is pretty thin. And I wasn't sure what the minimal thickness should be. I think this is 0.9 millimeters and I wanted to make sure that there is enough material so it wouldn't just bend when I touch it. So reducing the material at these locations would have made the parts a little bit smaller. But in my case it wouldn't have mattered because I wanted to use an off-the-shelf stainless steel tube. And they only come in certain diameters and the next size down would have been way too small. And that's basically the reason I chose this diameter. Some of you also wanted me to talk about the power supply. There honestly isn't that much to it but I thought I would cover it briefly in this video. I am by far no expert regarding electronics, so this is definitely not a tutorial on how to build a power supply like that. And it would probably be smarter to use a power supply that is meant for magnetron sputtering. First you can see that there is a power control unit by Kemo, the M028N here in the corner. The thing is it doesn't work, at least not for me. My problem is that if I connect it to my transformer and I turn the potentiometer on the front, there is no output at all until it suddenly jumps up to 600 volts. So that's not usable for me. So I just disconnected it and directly wired my transformer to the mains uh, input. Which of course means that you should never plug the power supply directly into your receptacle on the wall. I'm using a variac to control the power to the microwave oven transformer. If some of you might know why my power controller here is not working, I would appreciate a comment or if you have any better idea to have a small form factor unit that can control the voltage to the transformer. One side of the high voltage output of the secondary coil of the microwave oven transformer first goes to a fuse. It is a one ampere fuse before it goes into my rectifier down here. On the left side you can see my voltage divider. It is a 1 to 10 divider and that basically means that I can read the voltage at the analog voltmeter at the front panel from 0 to 100 volts which means 0 to 1000 volts. To smooth out the voltage coming from the rectifier I'm just using two microwave capacitors. Here you can see the voltmeter connected to my voltage divider and on the left side here is the ampere meter which is just connected in series with the output from the capacitors before it is connected to the BNC connector at the front. So there's basically not that much to it um, but yeah some of you asked so I thought I would show it to you. Before we talk about the cost of the components I would like to thank the company that manufactured these parts and also sponsor today's video PCBWay. If you're like me and you don't own a milling machine or a lathe but still need precisely fabricated metal or plastic parts for your projects, PCBWay is the perfect partner. You can simply upload your file to their website, choose the desired material and receive an immediate price estimate. If you need threads in your part, you can simply upload a drawing and PCBWay will take care of the rest. And well, who would have thought, but PCBWay can also manufacture PCBs. But not only that, they can do 3D printed components, sheet metal parts or injection molded parts. A huge thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. And now let's move on to the cost of the respective components. To simplify the matters I will round the prices to the nearest dollar. All stainless steel components were made from 316 stainless steel. The top part of the ground shield cost me $100. The two clamps for the cave 16 flange cost me $36 each, so $72 in total. The target clamp cost $63. Due to the many screw holes and ventilation holes, the lower part of the magnetron was the most expensive component, costing me $227. The intermediate piece cost me $203. The magnetic yoke, made from A34 mild steel, cost me $39. The copper cooling plate cost $155. The copper backplate was a good bit cheaper at $91. The Teflon insulation ring cost me $54. And the PTFE insulation sleeves for the screws cost me $166 for 12 pieces. These sleeves were probably one of the most expensive parts, since they are turned from a solid round bar of Teflon. It would be wise to consider a cheaper option here. In total, all of the components of the magnetron that I had custom made cost $1170. Additionally, the stainless steel tube for the ground shield cost me an extra $18. And I purchased the vacuum feed through for $140. As mentioned earlier, I received the stainless steel tube with the KF16 flange from Vissel Vacuum for free. 
However, I suspect one would have to pay around $50 for this. So all in all, the Magnetron did cost me $1408. Definitely not a cheap endeavor. But considering the fact that these are very high quality components and I can use it for many projects, it was definitely worth it for me. You will see the device in several more of my videos. If you don't want to miss those, consider subscribing to my channel or supporting me on Patreon. You can find the link in the video description. And a huge thank you to my current supporters on Patreon. You make my projects possible. Other than that, thank you a lot for watching.